Did you know that you could take a Chardonnay vine, cut it off so that just the rootstock is available, and then bud in Merlot so that the next crop that comes out is Merlot? Why are you able to do this? How are you able to do this? When did this happen? Tonight on SIP episode 133, budding and grafting of vines. And we do it with Nick Goldschmidt of Goldschmidt Vineyards, all while drinking his 100 case production Carignan from vines over 100 years of age in the Dry Creek Valley. SIP episode 133, budding and grafting is here. You're going to have to listen very quickly this evening because our guest and I have a lot of material to get through. So listen fast. Uh, I do want to say my name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Seller Angels, and we founded Seller Angels in 2010, uh, really to kind of help the small limited production winery gain a larger audience and get their wines to market. For those of you that aren't intimately aware of how the three-tier system works in the United States, it is a compliance and regulatory nightmare, especially for the small limited farmer or limited production family making wines. So 13 years ago, we set out to help them uh, because oftentimes like this winery and vineyard that you see behind me, they're producing some of the best wines in the Valley coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now. They just don't make a lot of it. Tonight's wine was made in 100 case productions and very few distributors are going to carry 100 case wine. Uh, it's just not economically feasible for them in most cases. So that's why we founded Cellar Angels. You can learn all about the company on the Cellar Angels website where I strongly encourage you to navigate and look at because it is a wealth of knowledge on all things Napa and Sonoma. I right now I'm on the online wine marketplace. And the first thing you're going to see above that is that we have a July event. So the angel portion of the Cellar Angels name is our, a, an ode to our philanthropic bent. We raise money through wine sales to use in philanthropy and mission causes for various charities. Many of you have seen pictures of these throughout the years where we will be at events. We were just at an event two weeks ago in Chicago, helped raise over $200,000 with wines. And interestingly enough, one of the gentlemen's wines uh, that we're featuring tonight was it at that event, and it was the first wine awarded. Uh, it was an amazing poll, but this is what the angel portion is all about. We have a July event. Save the Family Farms is a very, very mission-driven group out of Napa that is trying to help establish a microwinery ordinance so that these small wineries can actually get a little bit of foot traffic. They have no interest in making 100,000 gallons uh, and building grand tasting rooms. They just want to be able to have eight to 12 people a week. So this is what's going to happen if you acquire six bottles. Any six bottle purchase, 10% of the proceeds will go to save the family farms. Uh, you can get a SIP kit by the way, which is how many of the folks are drinking Nick Goldschmidt's Carignan this evening. There's four bottles coming up. I mentioned Chad Angelo. His stagecoach Cabernet is in the next sip, sip kit. Uh, those four bottles are for the events July 21st through August 11th. But the wine marketplace is full of opportunities to buy wines you're not going to see in your local store. And again, six bottles or more throughout the month of July with each six bottle purchase, 10% goes to save the family farms. Tonight, we're drinking the Goldschmidt Vineyards 2019 Grace Point Carignan that from Dry Creek Valley. And I'm going to show you this vineyard site in a second, but uh, it's a very special wine. We're going to get into it. But before we do, last week's quiz winner, the answer, vine grafting since ancient Roman times was the question, became vital at the end of the 19th century. Why? And the answer was phylloxera B. Now, this week, we decided to award not just 100 points, but 10,000 points. But the winner had to be present. And Jeff isn't present this week. He just texted us. So it's a shame that those 10,000 points will not get deposited into Jeff's account. So it's back to 100. Doug R. Doug and Lorraine are on. What? Oh, Doug, Doug and Lorraine are on. Doug and Lorraine are on. Mission Control. Okay. Well, yep. Yeah, Doug R. is here. So Doug is the recipient of 100 points. Uh, next week, we'll see what happens. Julie F., you were third. But this is uh, also, I mentioned Save the Family Farm. There is also a new Facebook group, Sipsters. So you have a private group to share photos, talk about this evening's guest behind his back because the Facebook group isn't live. Uh, but definitely to share some photos, share some ideas, share questions. Uh, and Mission Control is going to put that in the chat. 
So that is coming up. And by the way, wine club members get excited. The canteen that you all receive with the QR code, the QR code has changed. So this is the quintessential accoutrement for anybody going to the beach, the pool, your children's soccer game. I know what these things are filled with at nine o'clock in the morning on the soccer sidelines. So it's not water, uh, but this is a ice and hot beverage holder. And the the uh, QR code has been changed to reflect the most recent wine cup sh shipment. That is a great club for you to be in. Now, let's talk about tonight's guest because it's a man who really needs no introduction. And quite honestly, I would use up 15 or more minutes introducing Nick Goldschmidt. He is one of the perennial favorite guests of the Sipsters. His wine knowledge is, in my opinion, unrivaled, not only from just a wine making standpoint, but also from the uh, viticultural enology standpoint. He doesn't just make wines in California, but I forgot how many country he is, countries he is now either making wine in or consulting in. Uh, he is certainly the most interesting winemaker in the world. So I think we should give it up for Mr. Nick Goldschmidt of Goldschmidt Vineyards. Cheers, my yeah. friend. Good afternoon, Martin. How are you, man? Good afternoon, Sipsters. Hope you're doing well. So, I'm so well. Uh, last time we caught up with Nick, he was quarantined in New Zealand. <laughs> it probably felt like quarantine. Yeah, uh, probably. But you also had at that point in time, some very memorable quotes. And one of them was a uh, perfect opportunity to, you know, make lemonade out of lemons. People were down about peeing sequestered at home. And, and you essentially said, Martin, I'm here with my family. Had it not been for a pandemic, I wouldn't be spending all this time with them. So we're all in the same house, which was a, a gift that a lot of people didn't get. So that was kind of a, a, a fascinating, fascinating way to look at it. But you also said, uh, listen, if you drink a bad bottle of wine, it's like throwing a good one against the wall. So don't drink a bad bottle of wine, which I love. Yeah, so, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. And and you you produce a lot of good bottles of wine, but bring us kind of current where with what you've been doing the last you know six, nine months and, and where you are today and where you're going to be. Well, I'm certainly currently sitting on Lake Tahoe. You can see that, which is okay. I'm actually on vacation. Um, this year, I've done 38 airplanes. I've been in nine countries, and um, yeah, and I'm about to leave again. Next week, I go to Canada. The week after, I go back to Chile. The week after that, I'll be in Argentina. Back to Chile again for another three weeks. Come back. It'll be off to Chicago. Then it'll be harvest time. Back to Chile. So, yeah, nonstop. When I've just, but I've had a really good time. I've just spent. Uh, two and a half weeks in Rioja and Ribera de Dura in, in Spain, and then was in Cognac, and then on Sommer and Chinon, and down to Sancerre, uh, over to Lyon, and then up to Barola and Barbaresco, which I'd never been to before. And it was really exciting because, you know, I'm a regenerative farmer, and a lot of what I saw was all about dry farming and, and the challenges that they're having, as we are, with dry farming as well. So it's not, you know, a lot of what I do also travel-wise is educational, so it's not just about consulting. And so when... Uh, I out of curiosity, when are you going to be in Chicago? Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> a late August. Be... I mean, late uh, August. Okay, hold that thought in your head because we're going to be in Chicago in late August. So, uh, as Sipsters, just sit back for a second 23rd, while Nick and I coordinate our travel plans. Uh, 23rd, 24th, 25th. All right, we're in town, sir. We actually might get to meet in person. So, that'll wow. be great. Uh, perfect. I want to, so you're, you're visiting, I mean, you you grew up in New Zealand, and and when when was your first wine epiphany? I don't even know if I know this story. Um, I don't really have one. I mean, I, I mean everything has just been experienced. Like, I mean, I can't remember the year of the birth of my children, but I can I can name every vintage. Um, yeah. But my first vintage in California was 1989, and then I came back to California full time in 1990. And as you know, I was a corporate winemaker for 26, 27 years with CME, LVMH and Constellation. And then I ran the largest wine company in the world called Allo Demec, which became uh, Jim Beam. Uh, we had 100 and, 150 wineries in seven countries. And so I lived on an airplane. So I've been, I, I, I mean, I travel sort of eight months a year, uh, even now, which is what I've been doing pretty much for the 37 years I've been in here, the 30, whatever, 34 years that I've been in California. Yeah, and it's exciting, I, man. I, I was going to ask you, I mean, there's there's no moss growing underneath your feet. That is for sure. And 
but you, you've been doing it so long. It's, it's, you are one of the hardest working people I know in wine and not just in this country, but I mean, you're traveling, like you said, eight months out of the year. What other than caffeine, what keeps you going? What still excites you? Cabernet, man, Cabernet. That's all it is. <laughs> Making the best. There's so much Cabernet that's uncharted yet. Um, but, you know, really, I'm, I'm working on a new winery that we're building in southern Chile that's never been built so far south on the on the 42nd parallel. And then I'm working on a winery about to be a winery in Kenya, grown on the second parallel. And then uh, a new winery we're going to build in Georgia, uh, country of Georgia. But also, you know, working as far north up in, in Okanagan Valley in Canada, or figuring out how far north we can grow vinifera. We can grow, we can grow hybrids up there, but you know, latitude is only one thing, altitude is the other piece. So working out the combination of all uh, in terms of making fine wine. Yeah, I mean, we can all, I mean, we can make sparkling wine because uh, we don't need it to be, you know, that long a, long a hang time to get things right. But to, good, to make really good Bordeaux um, is another challenge completely. And so you get excited, like you can feel it in your bones when, when these new vineyard opportunities uh, come across your desk and you get to fly somewhere and you get to look at the land and you, you do soil specimens. Do you look at the composite, the topography, the wind? Do you, I mean, is that how you kind of geek out over it? Not at all. I look in the guy's eyes and I see if they're into it or not. Um, really? Yeah. I, I mean, they've got to have the passion, man. And, 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 and I think that that's lacking a little bit these days. I think there are so many sort of wealthier people that have come into the industry and bought a piece of land and built a, a monument to themselves and you've got to have the passion you've got to have the drive and the knowledge and the experience you can't just rock in and buy your way and i i don't know it's it's only done here in the u.s the rest of the world has moved on that um and we could talk a lot about that but <laughs> anyway no so, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking in my head you know golf course architects and stuff like that where they get a call and someone says i need you to see these 200 acres and they're like yeah i know you don't have the topography i need but when they get there there's something that just says holy cow this is a special place and, and i'm which curious if there's any type of overlap when you see vineyards or are you really just looking at i need to meet the person who wants me and if they've got the magic in the eyes i'm in that's pretty much it and then i go look at the property i mean it still has to be a a worthwhile project um I have to, you know, as I said, I'm a regenerative farmer, so it has to sort of be environmentally the way that I see the future, um, taking responsibility for the stewardship of the property. Because the problem is when you plant a vineyard, I mean, you're changing, <laughs> you're moving a lot of dirt. And, uh, you know, we don't take that lightly and we certainly don't want to be chop chopping down old forests, which um, had come up in one of my other opportunities. Um, so we we avoided that and found other properties other places to do what we wanted to do uh yeah and then then yeah looking at how we're going to plant it because a lot of these things are on hillsides especially if you're talking about long way south or long way north you've got to be on hills because you need the heat and you've got to be away from the ocean so the further south north you are the more inland you sort of need to be so and why location. is that well because um we need we need more heat i mean the advantage of water is that keeps the winter temperatures more moderate Mild, but you yeah. don't get the heat from the summer um but and then we've got to monitor frost you know frost is the big deal if you're inland so being on a lake is much more interesting than being on the ocean if that makes sense um no, it's, and it's fascinating i never even thought and, about it that way and then we start looking at um the the microbes in the soil and then what the soil makeup chemically is as well uh, we'll look at all of that because you get one chance to develop a property to to add supplements or or not add supplements. You get one chance to do that because once you've got the vineyard planted, it's very hard to go back and and change the change the chemical makeup of the of the soil. So pH is really important and and that is becoming a real issue without the rainfall. And as you've as we spoke yesterday, the average global temperature is increasing every day as we see. And if we get less rainfall, we don't get leaching. If we don't get leaching, we get more salinity. If we get more salinity, we have to change the rootstocks and we have to change the pH of the soil. And when you don't get, when you get too much salinity, it changes the profile of the wine, which was really a big discussion point for when I was in Ribera de Duro um, talking to winemakers there. And they were complaining about the lack, lack of acid shift during fermentation. I'm like, dude, let's check out your iron, <laughs> you know, because without leaching, you got high iron. 
and other heavy metals that are just not being leached away. And a great example would be Langhorne Creek in Australia, which basically has become a desert um, because they're pumping out of Lake Elizabeth. And without rainfall, that you know that place just hasn't succeeded. So we certainly don't want to go down that track. You know, so and there's so a lot much, of things to think about. Yeah, I was going to say there's a ton. It's an endless array of variables. And how much of them can you influence? Uh, I mean, you can't influence the rain per se. So you need that moisture. Uh, you talk about regenerative farming and some of the vineyards you're putting in are brand new, if I'm hearing you correctly. So does the regenerative farming play a role there? Because are you taking over for a crop that has long since been discontinued and, and the land's been neglected? Tell well, me let's a little look bit at about that, the variables. That photo, yeah, Go Martin, ahead. that photo behind you, you can see that um, this is a brand new vineyard, but it's <clears throat> it still has the grass that died off. And because of the, the summer heat, now, normally we would not mow it, but I mowed it because it's a young vineyard. So we mow the vineyard until the vineyard is about three years old, and then we'll start letting it, like, uh, then we'll start crimping. So we use a machine that rolls over the weeds and actually breaks them. So we still get the seeds that will form for next year. Uh, the key thing with regenerative farming is measuring what you take out of the vineyard, not what you put in. That's the main difference between organics, biodynamics, and regenerative. And in organic and biodynamic, you can actually disc. So that vineyard would be disced and you'd see brown dirt if, uh, if that was a normal organic vineyard. The second big issue, of course, is irrigation and that we don't want to irrigate the, the weeds. And let me go back. The, the weeds that we allow to grow in the vineyard are native weeds, not weeds that were imported by tractors from other parts of California right. or other parts of the US. So, And we know that the weeds that are native to Alexander Valley, Russian River or Napa, have a lot, a lot more low profile. We don't get the weeds growing up into the canopy, so we can control it that way. Less tractor work, less mowing, less um, uh, compression, vine disking. Yeah. Yep. And so, and, in regenerative and, farming, you can't disk. No. Interesting. No, the whole idea is um, you want to build up the organic layer, and when you when you disk, you're destroying the organic layer every time. The topsoil blows away. Another good example would be Barossa Valley. They've been disking that area for about 150 years. There's no soil, there's no topsoil left in the Barossa. It's all pretty much just sand. And um, yeah, so wow. <laughs> I think building organic is, is, a, is, a, is a nerve wracking experience between year four and six. But once you get to year six, you know, you start getting the, the good insects start coming in for a longer period of time rather than the bad insects. We start building up the, the number of microbes in the soil uh, the nematodes in the soil, because it's those guys, those bacteria, those nematodes that are actually breaking down the chemicals that the vines need. And it just takes a long time. But of course, the point of the conversation that you wanted to have today goes back to the type of rootstock that we're using. We've certainly, I've been using the same rootstock now for almost 20 years. I do not regret the decision that I made 20 years ago, and I'm still using the same sort of rootstock today, and that I'm using deep, really deep rootstocks. Um, and now are you using a uh, really deep rootstock because of your fondness for Cabernet and it just works well with Cabernet or would it work well with anything? Well, whenever I see a stone, I want to know where the clay is. And clay is a really important attribute in soil profiles because clay holds more water than loam or sand. And so we want the roots to go down to where the clay is. And then the roots will go ac across the the clay. So this, the vineyard behind you, the, the clay is about a meter and a half down, multiply that by three if you want to convert to feet. Um, and the roots will go straight down to that clay, then go across. So we want to irrigate down to the clay so that there's moisture there through the whole season. And that's why it's important with dry farming. You, can, you, you, you can't not have winter rainfall with dry farming. If you don't have winter rainfall, you're not putting moisture into the clay. Now, Merlot is really important with clay. You've got to have really good clay soil for Merlot because Merlot has a bigger berry than Cabernet. If you dehydrate Merlot 10%, that's a much bigger change in the berry size than it would be for Cabernet. And all you're concentrating is sugar, acid, and tannin, so you're not, you're not getting full maturity. So we used to look upon clay as being a detriment. Today, I look upon clay as being an advantage. No, I, I think, I mean, I know you're right because obviously you're you and I don't know, but I'll just give you that, that you're right. Um, and it's interesting you said we, you, how did you say it? You said, because you need, the, it goes, it's uh, three meters or a meter down multiplied by three and a half. Uh, so you're looking at 18 feet or so. And you said you, you drill down or you three. No, no, no. It's about one meter is about three feet. So 
a little bit more than three feet. So we're talking about three, four, five feet down. Okay. Um, and then we we irrigate for five feet. So, so to you irrigate, irrigate for five feet. Okay. That block behind you takes about five hours, five to five to seven hours of irrigation to get to five feet. And then it hits the clay layer, and the roots just will spread out. They won't go through the clay. They will eventually. Right now, that vineyard is very young, so um, I'm I'm more inclined to give short shots because I just want to irrigate the the weeds. But eventually, you can see there's a hose. Um, between those vines, I'm going to take that hose and bury it about eight inches below the vine root, and I'm going to put copper nipples on it so the roots don't actually go into the to to the to the hose. And then I've mm. got a pressure gauge. I've got this new. We got a new machine, a new thing called a Lumo, which measures the amount of pressure that so I can spot if there's a leak underground. And I won't be irrigating the weeds. I'll only be irrigating the vine. But I'll do that on year three. Uh, Dahlia has a question with regards to clearing some of the rows about if you use sheep, goats, oh, etc., yeah. or anything like that. <laughs> Nothing. Only the pretty ones, Dahlia. Only the pretty sheep. <laughs> Especially in New Zealand. Um, so yeah, we use uh, this is regenerative farming is where I got into it in New Zealand. And yeah, certainly we use sheep every year. Um, sheep are really stupid though. They run, they go right through the irrigation line. So you either got to oh. lift the irrigation line up or you got to put it down. The problem in California, though, we have big, big problem in California with sheep because they're like um, coyote fodder. So uh, coyotes are a really big issue. They can jump anything. And more importantly, they can go under fences. There are certain dogs that you can get, but the, the coyotes are so smart. They they know the dog and they'll send one dog, one coyote in and four over the back fence. I mean, it's crazy. So yeah, farming with sheep is really, really hard in California. And expensive. Oats, and expand. goats goats are probably more easy, easier but goats cause more damage but they do eat rougher weeds than than um what they do with sheep but regenerative farming goes hens sheep cows that's the order interesting uh and we'll get back to what makes a sheep pretty or not so uh let's circle back to that. let's circle back yeah, to that nice. exactly 100 percent. so <laughs> i love the aspect of regenerative farming and the the focus tonight is kind of vine grafting and I, I think vine grafting is one of those unknown areas to me it's almost like a little bit of which which doctor medicine because you can change virtually everything you want to change about the vine except the rootstock so now you've been using the same rootstock for 20 years and my guess is you've grafted over in numbers of continents different vines to different rootstock and i want to know how that process gets done how do you decide to do it is there any limit to the number of times you can do it? And why did it originally start? That's a long, long question. Well, let's start. That's a good point. How did it start? Well, everything was really cool until 1990, as you mentioned. Well, we, we had the first phylloxera outbreak in the early 1900s, and then they had the second phylloxera outbreak in 1989. And there's two forms of vitis. Vitis vinifera, which is what you know, Cab Chard Malo, which is the top, and then vitis labrasca. Nebraska is only on the east coast of the US or China, and it, Nebraska is what's resistant to phylloxera. Now, AXR1 and 1202 were the two main rootstocks that were used pre-1989, and we didn't realize because the French had lied, and they had blended a <laughs> bit of vitis vinifera into the vitis Nebraska, so that it wasn't really uh, resistant to what became biotype B of phylloxera. It was resistant to biotype A, but not B. The other part of the problem was when we were planting 60, I'm talking about the 60s, 70s, 80s with um, AXR1 and 1202. At that time, we were using things called field selections. They were often called field selections, mass selections, or masal in Spanish, meaning you can go into the vineyard and you can select, you, you go into the vineyard and you, and, you, and you taste all the vines and you find one vine. In fact, I drew a little drawing here. I don't know if you can see it, but you can find one vine that might be that might be a little pineapple-y and then another okay. line that might be a little bit more melon so warm fruit to cool fruit you know grassy and citrus and pit fruit and so we would we'd have names for these things we had names called spring mountain root sea wenty bado yep. calera mount eden so we had names for these old mass selections i'm assuming i've got it up the right way um and so we could take cuttings just from the ones that we thought were pineapple-y and that became 
you know, and then we plant that. And then we go to the same vineyard and find the one that was even more pineapple and that became pineapple squared. And we find the one that was more pine pineapple cubed and that became Spring Mountain. And then we could choose, you know, for something that was less tropical or more citrusy or more grassy. And so this is what a mass selection is a field selection. When we took those cuttings and we take those cuttings in the winter, we had a stick with three buds on it and we take our knife, as you alluded to earlier, and we can chip that bud off that stick. And on the rootstock, we make a little T, we slip it in, matching the cambium lamp, tape it up, and we can grow Chardonnay, no problem. Now, when 1989, when we discovered that AXR1 was not resistant, the scientists said, well, we have to use Labrasca. So repestris is the big one. So a lot of, a lot of rootstocks come from repestris. There's three forms of, of Labrasca, but repestris is the main one. And, but when we took these mass selections, field selections, and put them on top of what was now Nebraska, we started to get virus. Leaf roll, stem pitting, corky bark, yields went down, and everyone panicked. And that's when the scientists said, we can solve this problem by cloning. So they went into the vineyard and they found one vine that for some reason didn't show any virus, and that became clone one. And the other way to do it is how I got into, this is, I know this sounds funny, Martin, but this is the way I got into grapes, 1981, where you could take a leaf, we slit the vein, put it on an agar plate, we grow the vine, we take the tip, grow the vine, take the tip, grow the vine, we do it three times. It's called merry stem tissue culture or heat treatment. And what you're doing is you're outgrowing the virus. And then you put that on the Nebraska, no virus, virus free. Hmm. But what we did was we bred out all the flavor. <laughs> and that's why today Chardonnay tastes between stone fruit, which are the Dijon clones, and pit fruit, which are the UC Davis clones. And so it's very rare to have these selections around today. And that's what I pride myself on. So, for instance, the Carignan that we're going to try tonight is an old mass selection, an old field selection, because it was planted almost 150 years ago. So that's I pride cool. myself on making Chardonnay up in this quadrant, you know, sort of more textural, uh, sorry, more structural, where am I? More structural and a little bit more subtropical rather than just being this white peach Granny Smith thing that all the shine. So that's why these, being able to, to bud some of these old, these old selections onto the new rootstocks is really important. All right, I'm gonna attempt to show a video of budding. It's a minute and a half or so in length, and we'll, we'll, it's in a vineyard in Napa. So I'm going to have you, and you'll see, Nick, uh, this person has a pretty banged up thumb. Uh, I would lose all my fingers, I'm sure, at some point in time, but uh, it's not accidental that there's a bandage on the thumb, I, I believe. So, uh, and you may need to turn your volumes up. So approximately two weeks ago, these vines were cut off. They literally cut off the tops of the vines and disposed of the cordons and the wood and the and the trimmings and everything and they basically let the vine just kind of sit there for a little bit and as the time frame goes on the bark starts to slip at the cambium the cambium layer becomes very uh, is, is where we want to put the graft and it's basically just putting a bud on top of the cambium layer so the cambium and the new bud have to adhere to each other and callus and that's where it'll start. We know this vine is still obviously alive even though there's no fruit and no big canopy on it but that gives a chance for this to uh, to heal, to callus and to start growing. So these were probably just grafted within the last week and therefore we don't see any green growth yet coming out of that little window between the tape. And generally a budder will put two buds on kind of an insurance policy. Uh, in case one doesn't make it, there's always a second chance for the, the second one to come through. It is a skill. It's not just anybody can go out there with a sharp knife and uh, just put a bud under there and call it good. So a skilled operator with a good sharp knife, I mean, it has to be a sharp knife, has to make sure that bud is exactly flat on the back side so that the cambium is matching the cambium. And that's the key to successful grafting. And the, and the flaps actually help hold the bud tight as well to the cambium layer of the, 
on the trunk there and then you can see when he wraps that he's wrapping very tightly try to minimize all the air that's going to be in there to help keep it from drying out. But he's doing a chip butt on this one right here versus a T or an inverted T and he has a reason for that. He probably feels it's a better chance for a take in there and that's what he did is he removed a little piece of wood and he's doing a a typical chip like you would on a rootstock. But again, just as long as cambium is matching cambium, that's the key. So they've already relieved the, the hydraulic pressure right here. The trunks have already been slashed to help keep the sap flow coming up for a while and let that have a time to heal. Otherwise, that sap flow would be too much on this open wound now and push that bud out theoretically. So they come in and pre-cut these, and that's what this bleeding is down in here. It's not going to hurt the vine. It's just a very shallow cut with a saw. Here's one that's already starting to push a little bit. Uh, again, I put a little nick in here in the trunk to relieve some of the hydraulic pressure and this one is actually starting to grow. And I think with all the warm weather, this is probably an indicator that this is going to take off pretty quick. It is, it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's, it's uh, witchcraft. That's that's what I'm going with. And that's Mike no, Neal. He's one of my best friends. No way. Yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately, he he's, that, that must be an old video because he's not. Uh, he's actually retired now. It could be an old video, but I think it's fascinating that, and you can explain this. You know, they they slice the bottom of the root, and that he says relieves the hydraulic pressure. What is he talking about there? Well, there's so much phloem, so phloem and xylem. So there's so much pressure because what you've done is you you've taken the top of the the vine away and you still have this massive root system that root system is like a big pump so it's pumping uh moisture up the up the trunk of the vine and if you didn't relieve if you didn't allow it to bleed it would actually push that bud out of the out of the setting it was interesting the way he did the chip bud though because that's not the way we do it in new zealand so with a chip bud we actually take the knife and we cut straight down and we we don't cut the um, cut the bark away. We just slip it straight in. Whereas with the the T bud though, we did exactly the same. But that's budding. That's not grafting. All right. So that's budding. And so now explain what grafting is. So grafting uh, would be if you go to the top of where you cut the plant. So if you go to the where he, so in this situation, instead of putting the bud down here like this, like the T, he goes right. straight in on the top. So this is grafting. We call it a wedge gra a graft. So you just make a, a a wedge and you cut in on the top of the vine and you put those. Um, sorry, a clef graft. What am I talking about? It's a clef graft where you where you make a you put two um, pretty good sized shoots. You know um, they'll have two buds on it probably or three buds mm -hmm. even, and you actually cleft it right into the top and and you paint that and and uh, tape it up. Um, if you ask me which one is better, I think I, I like to use the T bud better because I my because I'm not a professional at it, so my chance of success on a T bud is higher than it is on a chip. Um, grafting though, you have to peel away the bark on the on the um, on the stick that you're putting in. You have to peel it away, and you've got a very fine line of that cambium right on the outside of that cleft to match up with the big old vine. And that's that's why today, not many people do cleft grafting. It's a lot harder process to do. But when I was a kid, it was a pretty common way for us to do it because cleft, cleft grafting means you probably jump the, jump the plant by about six months. And you talk about the cambium and that, that layer. Uh, and here- Oh, there. <laughs> there you go. So- um, Yeah. Well, you're right about, and we saw the matching on the budding side of things, and this is uh, the angled rootstock and the sign of within the interlocking tongues. Um, but I just can't imagine you can do this at scale. Oh yeah, you can. No, they, these guys are these guys are very fast. Especially he that that video that Mike was on. That's an old vineyard. That that is easy to do. You can do that very quickly. It's when you're talking about two-year-old plants, which is what I like to do, we call field budding. We plant a rootstock, we leave it there for two years until we get a stick that's about this diameter. Mm -hmm. And then we'll chip bud onto that, excuse me. So that's much harder to do. 
um, and it's harder to see success. So it takes a little bit longer. So when, when like I'm talking about at scale, you're producing 100 cases of Carignan. Uh, if someone's producing 35,000 cases of wine from a vineyard source or a giant, one of those industrial farms, you can't do that. No, I mean, if the only, there's no reason to do that. The only, what, what Mike's video was showing you, what he was doing was he was changing the variety. So he probably had, I don't know, he's a Napa, because he's a Napa Valley guy. So he was probably taking Sauvignon Blanc and grafting it over and chipping, butting over to Cabernet. Some, you know, because the price of Sauvignon Blanc, because remember he was a farmer in the nineties. So that video was probably from the nineties. So he, you know, Sauvignon Blanc in those days was probably a thousand dollars a ton and Cabernet was $4,000 a ton. So they decided that it was easier to sell Cabernet and at a higher price. So that that's a way to change grape variety. Now on, at scale, you wouldn't do that. Um, once the vineyard hits 30 years old, you're more likely to pull the vineyard out. And if that vineyard was 30 years old, they probably would have been pulling it out because that's sort of the commercial lifespan of the vineyard. And in, go in, in America. Whole, in America. When I was in the corporate world, it was 30 years. So 15 years, you'd appreciate it. And then the next 15 years, hopefully you make a little bit of profit. And then what we do today if you buy a plant, it's a what we call a dormant bench graft or a green tip. So a dormant bench graft is, is normally a rooted cutting that's about six months old. So they plant it now. And uh, yeah, that's so this is an example of a this is an example of a green tip. <laughs> okay, but it's very similar. So you can see up there, you see the little wax, there's little wax around up the top there where the graft union is. Um, and that's what holds oh, yeah. in the moisture. Yeah, right there, that's wax. And that's what holds in the moisture. So these vines were planted in June, whereas a dormant bench graft has no leaves on it and it has a bigger root system. And that would, those ones we normally plant in May, April or May. So All right, why so do we come into spring? This is a potted rootstock. And then Correct. you... You budded something onto this and then sealed it with wax to hold in the moisture. And that bud was only put on this year in May. So that's what and we then, call a green green tip. So it's only one, it's only about, this plant is only about five, six months old. Now, what will you do with this? We take it out of that carton and we put it in the, put it in the row. So you will go ahead and plant this? Yeah, we did. In fact, that vineyard, that photo behind you are these, are these vines, these exact vines. Oh, jeez. And then you put the little uh, white milk cartons around them? We do that because of weed control um, for the first 18 months. I, I'm not a big fan of them, really. I mean, tra traditionally, we would have those cartons or plastic tubes. They're recycled. They're reusable, those things. But normally, we used to have them on there for 18 months because it keeps the vine warm. Um, it doesn't give the, so you don't get the nighttime temperature. You can be far more accurate because when you're irrigating at this point, you want to irrigate right by the vine. When the vine gets older, you want to move the irrigation away from the vine. So you're irrigating the roots, not at the trunk. Right. Uh, and then, as I said, we want to protect against the weeds. We want to, you know, I'm going to send guys in there with weed whackers and they're going to, you know, I don't want to weed whack a young vine. <laughs> I'd kill the thing. So I just, they'll hit the plastic with the weed whacker rather than the plant itself. So is there a, a cottage industry of butters? Oh yeah, no, 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 it's big time. There are, there is, the, the field butters are becoming more rare. When I was, when I was, you know, back in 1990, almost every vineyard crew also had field butters. These days, I would say between Napa, Sonoma, I could probably name you 10 crews that can field butt. There's not many left, it's a lost art. Most of it's done by, um, dormant bench graft, you know, and the, and the dormant bench graft looks like this. So it's like mm. a jigsaw. This is the rootstock. This is the scion. This is the cabernet that we're putting on top, and and the roots will be here. And so that this is the way we traditionally buy vines today. And then, so what would cause you to want to make a decision to to bud something over? If I wanted to change the variety, yeah. Well, that's a that's a commercial that's a commercial decision. It's yeah. all economics. It's all economics, yeah. And that's why supporting varieties like Carrigan that we're going to discuss tonight is really, really important because if we don't persevere with these wines, um, we're just going to become Cap Chardonnay. Now, 
don't be offended. I mean, I make a living out of Cap Shard Malot. But <laughs> these other wines are really interesting. And at the older I get, the more traditional I become. Um, because I, I, I mean, I just, you know, I've just been all over Europe. No one's using barrels anymore. They're all using large wooden vessels, you know, food rays, we call them 30 hectolitre food rays. They're not, they're using a lot more concrete. We were using concrete in New Zealand back in the late seventies. We don't use any yeast. I've never, I haven't used yeast now in 40 years. I mean, it's suddenly I'm becoming cool because I'm right. doing the stuff that everyone's moving to. It's like, right. what? Well, I've been making what? I've been making my Chardonnay and concrete tanks for, I don't know, 30 years. <laughs> But right. suddenly what's, it's old, cool. what's old is new again and you're you're the hip guy that's been doing it for four decades <laughs> I, know. That's, I know it sounds funny but when you the thing that really interests me is like and i wasn't here but when the old italian guys came here and let's say the night pre-prohibition the 20s and 30s why did they plant the way they planted they dry farmed they used a rootstock called saint george which is not resistant to phylloxera but we still use St. George for various reasons today. And they planted Zim, Petit, Carignan, Moveg, Sinso, you know, all these weird and wonderful varietals that they knew and they field blended them. And so there's a lot to be said for why they chose these things. Now remember, because they didn't have irrigation, they chose right. these varieties that grew really well. And here we are today with the same situation. We're not, we have a little bit of water so we can't irrigate, but basically, we're moving more and more back to a dry farming situation. So what varieties should we be embracing? And carignan is really cool because it holds its acidity. So its life expectancy is a lot longer than, you know, some of these Napa, Napa cabs because the pHs are so damn high. I mean, I, I was with a Napa cab guy the other day. I mean, he, he only bottles at pH of four. You know, we know that, you know, this year I've had five 100 point wines from, from various magazines. And not one of them is over 14 alcohol, and not one of them has a pH more than 3.6. So hold that, we're not hold like that thought. This, you know? Hold that thought because I want to get to Karen Yon. But before I do, I want to launch a poll question. All right. So at one point in time, Karen Yon was the most planted wine grape in France. That's a clue for some of you. True, false, and for extra credit, you might think it's the second most planted. And why is, oh, there we go. Um, I'm like, why is no one voting? Everyone wake up, put the appetizers down. <laughs> I'll go my right now. So, and I'm wondering, and Nick probably knows this answer. I'm gonna give five, four, three, two, one. Look how many people fell for the extra credit. The answer is in fact true. Did you know that? Me? No. In the, in the early 1970s, it was the most planted grape in France because the government uh, provided a subsidy to grow Carignan. And there was at one point in time over 300,000 hectares planted of Carignan, enormous amounts. However, good and bad. The grape gained incredible popularity, but most of it was then distilled. And so it got a very, very negative public persona as a cheap kind of blending grape, uh, which I think still haunts it because you and I talked about this yesterday. I think it haunts uh, Carignan to today um, because to your point, it is an amazing uh, grape, amazing wine, uh, delicious. And so the second poll question is... How many of Nick's wines have been awarded 90 points or above from Wine Spectator, Wine Enthusiast, or Robert Parker? Uh, and for those of you that don't know, that's Wine Enthusiast right there, Robert Parker. The answers are 19, 31 wines, 54 wines, 73, or over 100. And I hear the tune to Jeopardy. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Now keep in mind, this is 90 points or above. And Nick just got done saying that this year alone, he's had five 100 point wines. So not, uh, you know, at various publications, which is, 
I'm, I'm not necessarily a point guy, but it's hard to argue with regards to that type of success when there's critics from a variety of magazines in a variety of countries placing these wines uh, at a very, very high level of distinction. So it just gives you what you've heard tonight, uh, an inkling, a little look inside of just how successful his philosophy and techniques are and, and what he's doing with regards to selecting vineyard sites and Nick, you don't just work with the vineyard site for, you know, three months and move on. What? The answer no. is more than a hundred. I'm sorry. More than a hundred of Nick's wines have received 90 points or above. More than a hundred. There's people that haven't made a hundred wines in their life. Nick's, Nick's got more Nick's got more than a hundred that have gotten 90 points or above. It's insane. And it's embarrassing. I don't send wine to the wine enthusiast or the wine spectator. Not anymore. We did that on your behalf. <laughs> no, because I, I submit to suckling and wine enthusiast. And they've, I, all, and they, they've all changed employers. Tasting panel. Yeah. No, I really oh, like the go. tasting panel. They're I really do cool. like them. I like the Beverage Institute as well, but I do like the tasting yeah. panel. So let's talk Carignan. Um, why did you decide to make a wine of 100% Carignan? Because I, because I can't say no. Um, so <laughs> I got a, I got a call from a young lady uh, who used to work for me at CME years ago, and um, she called me up. She goes, "I just inherited my sister and I inherited fifty acres at the end of Dry Creek, and it's all um, dry farm Zin and Carignan and Grenache." And I'm like, "What? What are you talking about? I know Dry Creek inside out, but I'd never actually ventured past to, right to the end of the bottom of." of Lake Sonoma, you know, I, I've, I've driven past it, but I never, I never um, stopped in. So I stopped in to see Kim one day and I'm like, holy cow, you guys have been given a blooming, this is like a gift from God. I mean, these, these, this Carignan, I think I sent you a photo, Martin, but this Carignan, look at these things. And that, if I was standing there, that vine is taller than me. I mean, these things are over six feet tall and they grow like trees and they're dry farmed. And so, and they produce very little cluster and just, I mean, who, any winemaker would want to make right. wine from this fruit. I mean, it's not like, I just said, Kim, shut the hell up. Don't tell anyone you got this stuff. <laughs> there's, a, there's another, um, there's another winery that takes the balance, but I've said that anytime that they choose to give up that fruit, I'll take it. And uh, it just, I mean, I don't do any, but I, I pick the grapes, I put them in a tank and I soak it for 10, 12 days, I press it and put it in a barrel and that's it. I don't do anything. I don't add any yeast. I don't add any acid. I don't, I don't add any, it's like, it's the stupidest, the oldest vine, you know, the, the older the vine is, the less you have to do. I mean, you know, I spend right. all my time concentrating on manipulating tannins on Cabernet tank, temperature up and down and moving and tasting. And this thing, I don't do any of that. I just soak it. You know, like, Chad Angelo, who uh, is also a winemaker, and he was the one I mentioned yeah. earlier, who sources from various vineyards, including Stagecoach, said, I would love some of that. So you're 100%. Sorry, Chad. <laughs> you can call me. I'll, I'll... <laughs> if some comes available, I'll give you some of the other. If the other person relinquishes some, I'll certainly get you some. Yeah, it's it's like uh, Chad is echoing your sentiments. If you're driving by or you pull in, you're like, wait, what the heck is that? I will take anything you have. And to your point, Nick, <laughs> these vines are 70 80 90 over 100 years of age and and they're probably if they could talk they would be like listen uh nick we know what we're doing here we've done this a while so you just kind of stay out of the way and put the wine in a bottle yeah that's all that we do but it's just unfortunately i get um i get five ton but i don't add any of the press wine so well i got and and of course uh 2020 we're, we're tasting the 2021 right um no we are tasting the 19. Oh, the night. Oh, man. The 19 is killer. Because that's that's the really bright one. The tannins are really vertical. Sorry, I'm, I'm up here on vacation. I didn't bring a bottle with me. The tannins are really vertical. But you also sort of get the shape coming through the mouth. So the wine builds and then just slowly fades away. And your point was really interesting about making wine from a vineyard for 10, 12, 15 years or whatever. So I've been making wine from this vineyard now for 12 years, not quite the 15, which is my rule. And I always joke about California because when Kim Jong-un drops a nuclear bomb and you're under the bunker, what are you taking? Mm -hmm. So you want to take wine from winemakers that have been making wines because you're going to be down there for 15 years, man. You better take <laughs> wine that's going to last 15 years. And there's two things about this. This vineyard has been around more than 15 years and I did nothing. 
So chances are it's going to last for 15 years. And I can show you a wine I made, you know, 12 years ago now, and it's the wine is still pristine. I mean, just incredible wine. Well, and I it's think so that's vibrant. It's like, <clears throat> well, and, and this is what makes, I, I want you to do in a second here, flavors, aromas, and pairings. So, uh, Carignan is a very, very food friendly wine because it's it's not as delicate as Pinot Noir. It doesn't have the petite Syrah. It, it is, it's got the fruits, it's got the bright fruits. And you just talked a little bit about the bright fruit and the acidity balance, but it it goes with a variety of meats, it goes with a variety of fishes, it goes with a variety of cheeses. It is extremely versatile. So what it, even though you don't have a glass in front of you, what do you remember about kind of the aromas and the you know thumbprint of, of this 2019 Carignan? Well, two days, again, 19 is a little bit more red fruit driven, whereas 21 is a bit more black. Same with 18. 18 and 21 are more black, 17 and 19 a little bit more red. So if you think about red fruit and black fruit, so high end red fruit would be loganberry, strawberry, red cherry, blueberry, black cherry, plum, blackberry, black currant, right? So you've got that range of fruit flavors. And then the other two terms we use are texture and structure. A textural wine comes in the mouth like this has this big fat richness in the back of the mouth and a structural wine comes in the mouth like this. It's tight because of acidity or CO2 or the temperature that you serve it at. And that's one thing you might wanna think about when you're drinking a red like this, especially in the summer, you know, just whack it in the fridge for about 15, 20 minutes before you open it, just put a little bit of chill on it and give it a bit more brightness. To answer your, say my, my food profile would be, or my, the fruit profile for me would be, uh, red cherry, blueberry, black cherry with a hint of plum. And for me, it's right in the middle. It's got a little bit of structure, a little bit of texture. You know, textural wine would be more like Napa Cabernet because it's a little bit sweeter because of the alcohol and the fructose. And then Alexander Valley Cab is going to be a little bit more red. But Carignan, this Carignan would be right in the middle. So very vibrant. And I learned a lot during COVID, of course, when, um, you know, there was nine in my bubble and we drank 1500 bottles of wine in 18 months. What I noticed after the first three months of Nick, we're not drinking the wines tonight in your order, we're gonna have an open forum here. And so what we, yeah, this, this is my COVID bubble. Um, so <laughs> it's funny to see that. It was a good night, they actually like all dressed up. They all dressed up. And um, that was the opening of the nightclub. We, we built a nightclub during, during COVID, <laughs> dance, dance pole and everything, it was fun. So. Um, what I noticed though was without any, you know, with all the seven or eight bottles every night open, we would just drink what you want. And what I noticed that was people started drinking the more red fruit wines with dinner because the red fruit has a little bit more acidity. So it's easy to go and have that second glass. And the Napa cabs, they were drinking with the cheese course at the end of dinner because cheese has a little bit more salt in it. And you, by, by the time you've been sitting down for two hours and eating and drinking and laughing, you know, your palate's a bit more tired, so you want something right. a bit heavier. And so that's when the Napa cab comes. So Carignan was always one of those things that we ate during dinner because it has a little bit more acidity, a little bit more red fruit, and it's much easier for that to go with food because it's got and a little bit lower alcohol than what some of the heavier Napa cabs were. In terms when you of talk about texture and balance, uh, the texture on this is fantastic. The, the tannins are fantastic. I mean, it is absolutely bar none uh, the best Carignan I've had. And we used to open this quite often in the in the store when we owned the wine shop to try to promote Carignan and, and the versatility and the food friendliness. Uh, many of them, I think, lacked the substance and, and lacked that oomph. Uh, they seemed a little thin. This one has all of it going for it and then some. And, and you mentioned on the back of the bottle, this could age for another 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, that's- Well, and I can, I, you know, I made wine 20 years ago, so I can show you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, the, I'll, I'll take you up on that. The brightness, the brightness, man, because the, the thing you, you won't see on any of our wines is you will not see any crusty stuff. So you know how wines move from purple to red to brown to orange. When you start seeing crusty stuff on the side of the bottle, that's the polymeric pigment that's falling out. And so that wine is therefore becoming brown and orange. That's the stuff, unless it was the year of your wedding or the year of your first child or the year of your birth, get rid of it, donate it, because that's the polymeric pigment. And that's the preservative falling out. You will not see that on this carignan because we've made sure that during the processing, we have this polymerizing um, stability thing that we do. And so you won't, that is not that that is not going to be your problem. That is not going to happen in the bottle. 
I want to show everyone uh, where Nick is sourcing this from and why perhaps uh, he's driven by this vineyard a bunch, but maybe not looked as hard to the left as he does now. Uh, but for those of you that are new to Cellar Angels, this is our playground. It's the Napa Sonoma area. And it, it's interesting for us to, to only source from Napa and Sonoma right now because there's some amazing wines coming out of this region, this being an example of them. And this will not see that I know of, you know, a store shelf somewhere or a restaurant list. It might be something local or a friend of Nick's. But when you start moving up Valley into the Sonoma County, you get an idea of just the size of Sonoma compared to Napa. And if I look at and put some borders and labels on here, you can actually see what we're talking about. So here I've got the city of Napa down here, which is just about parallel to Petaluma. But as we move north, you've got Yountville, Ronan Park, Santa Rosa, St. Helena. And then we continue to move north. And you can see that the Calistoga is about as far north a city as you can get in Napa, but Calistoga is not even up to Windsor yet on the Sonoma side. And then you go a little bit further north and you have the ability to move past Calistoga. Now you're up to Healdsburg and we're still not at where Nick sources this wine from. So when I put up this secret vineyard to see how far north it is, you get an idea that there is Lake Sonoma and this is honestly just below the dam. And you can see that it was dammed. I don't know how long ago, but as you get up to the secret vineyard up close and, and then you have the ability to drop on down street level and take a look at these tree trunks, they are a sight to behold. And you just drive by them and these things are, are large and massive. And they've been there, some of them, Nick, you said over a hundred years? Yeah, over 100 years. The, the trees that you see in the background there was to the traditional, um, well, still was the Dry Creek. And before they put the dam in, a lot of the area, Dry Creek was never really fully planted because in the winter, the water would come through. So it's pretty rare to have a vineyard of this age. And because this vineyard actually sat above the floodplain, it, 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 you'd be impressed if I'd taken a photo, if you, if you head towards the river, how how deep, how far down the bank is down to, um, to the, the Dry Creek River. That is a massive bank, um, huge drop oh, right off. In, right yeah. in here? Yeah, no, it's, it's big. Um, and the whole, the vineyard there to your left is a new vineyard that would never have been planted before the, uh, before the reservoir was put in. So that little tree line that you see between the Carignan and what's, what they grow down there is Sauvignon Blanc. That bank that you're looking at right there, I would say would be uh, 30 feet, probably. It's very, yeah, and very it's, steep. And you can see if I pull back. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, the, the river or Lake Sonoma is right up there. So that dam keeps all this in place, but that creek yeah. is incredible. Um, and so I've never gone past this either. I, I do want to go up to Lake Sonoma someday, but uh, this is a pretty special area. As I, you know, Nall is down here, Cast Wines is even a little bit further south, but this is way, way north in Dry Creek. I mean, it's amazing how far up you are. Yeah, the only part, the only piece that would be further up would be Rock Pile. Rock Pile is a sub-appellation of, well, it used to be a sub-appellation of Dry Creek. I don't know if it still is, but... Um, yeah, rock pile is the stuff that sits above. That reservoir, that dam was built in the 70s. Um, okay. So it's not it's not that old. And I live in Dry Creek. I actually live down, down the road further, um, closer to Healdsburg. And uh, in 2017, the, the amount of water coming out was phenomenal. In fact, we had a, a flood in my basement um, in 2017. So that's how much water can come out of that. Not, not out of the dam, but out of all the tributaries. Um, this right. year, believe it or not, even though the water, we had more rain this year, it, we didn't flood. Oh, the way thank goodness. Came. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's pretty thank funny. goodness. So how do people have the opportunity? I know you're a traveling man, but if people were going to be out in wine country, how do they taste with you or with uh, Goldschmidt? 
Um, you, of course, you can, um, you send in me an email at wine at Goldschmidt Vineyards. Thank you, Denise. Wine at Goldschmidt Vineyards.com. And if you've got a pen, the phone number is 707 431 8277. And, um, but yeah, wine at Goldschmidt We regularly do tastings in our office, either myself or my assistant. Well, she should be a winemaker too. She's been with me for 12 years. Fantastic lady. And, um, and she's Chilean, actually, but um, great lady. Or, uh, or you can taste with my wife. I mean, we're a small family business. We had a we had a tasting room for a while, but we found that it just wasn't meeting our needs. And a lot of um, uh, how how do I put this politely? A lot of tourists came through for other reasons rather than just uh, uh, enjoying wine and and things like that. So. We decided to. Um, I've got a couple more questions, but I want to show folks the bottle because it is incredibly special. Uh, it's, it's. I mean, it's this wine is delicious. I'm a little bit upset we only have this is our bottle, um, but I might I can remedy that. The Grace Point name in tier. Tell tell folks about Grace Point. Well, my wife and I argued about a name of our middle daughter, and uh, who turned out to be Catherine, and her name is Catherine Grace, and so. We always, it's a very family name. Her, my my wife's family name is Grace. And on my family side, there's a lot of Catherines. So as many, as some of you may know, we make a, our biggest selling wine is called Catherine Goldschmidt. It's pretty much available everywhere. Um, but uh, Grace Point, we make three wines under the Grace Point label and they're all over a hundred year old vineyards. We make a, a Zinfandel, a Petite Syrah, and then this Carignan. And um, they're all very special wines that I, I would never have, you know, that's why I'm really grateful for Saddle Angels because these are the sort of wines that we just, you know, we don't have a home for them unless we can find angels like yourselves to come out and support old vineyards like that and, and support small family businesses like ours as well. And, and all of us have been, or many of the angels on tonight's broadcast and episode know all too well some of the, the heart-wrenching stories where someone will pull out an ancient vine of Zinfandel of that nature and then plant Pinot Noir in the Russian River Valley as if the Russian River Valley needs more Pinot Noir. And these are the sorts of things that, uh, you know, Nick was fortunate enough to know someone from Simi and wine brings people together. And, and if you're good to people and, and help people, those, those relationships never go away. So she called Nick, told, told Nick about what she had. And 12 years later, he's still making wine from this vineyard. So it requires us to support this type of endeavor. And there, I mean, it's an amazing bottle of wine that you should have on your table. And it's one of those bottles. Granted, this is not an everyday wine. You aren't having this Tuesday night with tacos. You could, it'd be a killer taco meal. But, um, but you don't also always have to pull out a $150 bottle of Cabernet. This is right there in that middle sweet spot at $60 a bottle. And it wine club members, you get 10% off. So uh, it's a good opportunity to be a wine club member. But this is really a, a story within a bottle. And, and you know, that's what we want to do here at Stellar Angels is, is tell these stories. And we have a chance to do things uh, for which we're proud of and do them in a way that we hope you will tell others. Uh, so that's how we grow. And, and this is, you know, Nick, I, I can't believe how fast this hour went, uh, as usual. It, you know, time flies with you. I'm looking forward to potentially seeing you in Chicago at the end of August. I'm not kidding you. We will be there. Uh, so, uh, Angels, I want to raise a glass to you. Next week, we have uh, da, 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 ah, Bettina Seichel from Laurel Glen. Do you know she Bettina? and I used to work to, well, we used to work together at LBMH. She worked for a company. You can ask her about this. The Nick Goldschmidt and the Blue Nun, because um, she, she, well, you know. <laughs> was that an, was that an outfit you wore or? No, these parachutes, these people know. from parachutes jumped out of an airplane and holding Blue Nun. It was crazy. Anyway, Bettina, her father is super famous, um, yes. as you know, and uh, she's gone off to do her own thing. Just amazing lady. I loved working with her and I've got, I got some off the, off the uh, video stories about her as well. And she had to be. <laughs> As she has about me, probably. I'm sure she does. Uh, she yeah. is our guest next week, and uh, we are looking forward to that because I've, I haven't known her as long as you. I, I met her in the early 2000s when she was at Quintessa and followed her around since then. Uh, but it's, it's, again, small Laurel Glen Vineyard uh, winery. It's going to be amazing. Uh, Angels, it's we're midway through the year. Do yourselves a favor, please. If you're not in a wine club, you should consider it for all the perks. And also, don't forget July... Uh, six bottles or more, and you can help save the family farms. And I would 
be remiss if I didn't tell you to get make several of those bottles, some of this Carignan, because you will not be disappointed. Nick, uh, Godspeed, stay healthy. Thank you for being such an amazing inspiration. I can't believe how hard you work. Uh, looking forward to catching up with you in real life soon. Cheers, my friend. Thanks, Cheers. Thanks man. Thanks, Denise. Bye, all. Be good to one another.